As we move into this afternoon session and uh, listening to this morning and all of the things that we see that where we feel like there's resistance to something good and old ideas stopping new ideas, I think it's important to reflect that we have come a long way. Because I was just reminiscing with uh, our next speaker who's come all the way from Israel that it was only 37 years ago that there was major conservative forces in this country that did everything that they possibly could to stop the life of Brian from showing on our movie theatre screens. So we have evolved. Our next speaker this afternoon is Assistant Professor Dedi Miri from Israel. From anecdotal knowledge to evidence-based, the future of cannabis research. Dedi Miri is a principal investigator in the Laboratory of Cancer Biology and Cannabinoid Research in the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. He holds a Master of Science in Biochemistry and a PhD in Plant Biotechnology. Currently, his lab investigates the therapeutic potential of phytocannabinoids. The main focus of his research is to determine the anti-tumor effects of cannabinoids, including the anti-metastatic and proptotic effects. Other areas include cannabis treatment for colon disease, pain prevention, cancer treatment, and epilepsy. He runs the Cannabis Database Project and collaborates with other stakeholders for the purpose of revolutionising cannabis treatment. So please, a warm welcome for our guest from Israel, Pro Assistant Professor Dedi Miri. Thank you very much. Hello to everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me and for giving me the, the space to speak about my, uh, my work and my research. Um, as I was presented, I'm from Israel, from the Technion, which is the Technology Institute of Israel. Um, and my background is quite diverse. I have a, a master's in uh, biochemistry, a PhD in plant biology, and then I moved to Canada, to Toronto, where I did cancer research in the OCI, Ontario Cancer Institute. When I came back to Israel, I got a laboratory for cancer research in the Technion. And the main focus on the lab was uh, the ability of cells to start to migrate, actually to create metastasis. Normal cells in our body don't have the ability to move. There are cells that can move, like microglia or macrophages, but many cells in our body can't move. So my research was on that point, how a cell that usually don't have the ability to move, as a cancer cell getting this ability to start to migrate and to invade to, into new areas. So you can see cells here that crawling on a plate and they have ability to move, which normal cells wouldn't do it. And the question how, what is the changes in the skeleton of the cells cause this movement? And really when I established my lab and started, there was a paper by a Japanese group that showed that treating breast cancer with cannabis can block the ability of the cells to migrate. And I realized about this paper because they quote one of my work from my postdoc. Actually, they show that cannabis blocking the ability of the cells to migrate through a protein that I work on them, through a pathway that I work in my postdoc. So they like took my babies and, and used them, which I was offended. And so I looked on this paper and it was very interesting. And I, I had a professor in, in my bachelor's that said that an expert is somebody that knows everything about nothing. And as I told you with my background, a little bit biochemistry, a little bit plant biology, a little bit cancer, I saw that as an opportunity. I said, just a moment, these are plants, this is biochemistry, this is, they are talking about my pathway that I'm working. It looks something that can fit to my profile. And that's the way I reach 
cannabis research, okay? By accident. If it was spinach, it was easier, but it's cannabis. So the, I started to read a little bit more about cannabis and cancer, and I, I saw a group of papers by Manuel Guzman which show that using cannabis on glioblastoma can cause apoptosis in these cells. And apoptosis is when cells commit suicide. Every cell in our body has this machinery that he, have, he check himself that everything is all right. And if something is wrong, he will operate and apoptosis with its like self-defense, which it will kill himself in seconds, okay? A cancer cell, by definition, know how to avoid this process because if you wouldn't know, we wouldn't see it. Every moment in our body, 3,000 cells are committing suicide, or because they need to vacate the place, or because they realize that something is wrong and they are killing themselves. But cancer cell, by definition, is a cell that knows to avoid this, and then he's standing there and said, hey, I don't want to die. I realize something is wrong, but I, want, I don't want to kill myself. Okay, this is a cancer cell. So they showed, this Spanish group by Manuel Guzman showed, that in glioblastoma, when you treat these cells with cannabis, it can promote or bring back the ability for these cells to commit suicide. So that was very interesting. So we, the first question that we, we ask ourselves, is it just glioblastoma and breast cancer that cannabis can affect, or is it general to other cancers? Cancer, it's a given name to hundreds of different diseases, okay? And every type of this disease is totally different. There is almost no correlation between glioblastoma to prostate cancer to liver cancer and to colon cancer. It's different diseases. So cannabis, is it effective all types of cancer or just brain tumors and breast cancer? And second question, what the hell is cannabis? Okay. So I'm a plant physiologist. If you grow a plant and you touch him, more than the other plant, you have secondary, different secondary metabolites. I'm a son of agriculture. We grew strawberries. If you put picked strawberries afternoon, they are much more sweet than the strawberries in the morning. Okay? They're doing photosynthesis. There are more sugar. Never mind. But what is cannabis? It's a plant. So where you can start? Just in Israel, we have eight authorized growers. You see them here. Like every bulk is a different grower. And we have 91 different strains that have been offered to the patient. So where, where to start? So I went to one of my students, one of my postdocs, and told her, OK, let's pick eight types of cancer that we have in our lab. And let's take six different types of cannabis. So we picked uh, different types of cancer that we have in our lab. And I went to one of the girls and said, hey, Shai, give me Six different types of cannabis. I said, what do you mean? I said, I don't know. This is purple. This is green. It's probably different. This is good for the night. This is good for the day. It's probably different. And that way, we took the cannabis. So we are growing the cells in, in the lab. The cells growing in the plate like that. Actually, the plate look like that. And in the microscope, cells look like that. This is one cell. You can see it here. The dark thing inside is the nucleus with the DNA is inside. So in this image, you see something like 70, sorry, 70, yeah, 70 cells. But in, in a normal place, you will have between 2 million to 5 million cells, something like that, depending on the size of the cell. So we grow the cells. We did ethanol extraction from the cannabis. We took this extraction, and we put on the cells. So the first results that we have still, I think I did part of these experiments, OK? So you see the cells growing here. Because it's a lower magnification, you see it's like a texture, OK? These are cells. These are colon cells growing on the plate. We add extract number one, and all the cells die. We add extract number two, all the cells died. We add extract number three, and nothing happened to the cells. We took breast cancer, and we got similar phenomena. Now we took prostate cancer, and we add extract number one, nothing happened to the cells. We had extract number two, nothing happened to the cells. We had extract number three, they did nothing to breast cancer and colon cancer, it's killed the prostate cancer. When we take normal cells, and normal cells not growing on the plate, these are not normal, 
but they don't have cancer mutation, so the same amount of extract didn't affect them. So we we're very excited and said, okay, we're very excited because three main reasons. First, we see a distinguish between one extract to another. It's not general for cannabis, not that cannabis kill cancer. It's different types of cannabis affecting differently. Second, we see a difference between normal cells to cancer cell. And third, and the most important thing is the amount that we use. We use one microgram of extract. So if you're taking lemongrass or rosemary and you extract the oil from it and you put on cells, on cancer cells, eventually it will kill the cells. But if you now do extrapolation, how much you need to put, so an average person will need to eat 25 kilograms of rosemary every day in order to kill the cells. It also will kill more things in his, in his body probably, okay? But if you take cannabis and you're doing this extrapolation, it's around one gram to three gram. It's the average amount of a patient that used, okay? And if you consider, if you, um, if you look on how much you, we, we use chemotherapy, like Taxol, Vincrastine, Cisplatin, it's amount that's very similar. So we're talking about a material that is very potent. It's potent as chemotherapy on these cells, which is, was really, really surprising. So we were very happy. I called the grower and said, hey, Shai, what do we have? What is the difference between extract number two and extract number three? He said, I don't know. It's cannabis. He said, OK, how can I distinguish? He said, you can send it to a laboratory to read the cannabinoids. Fine. I sent the extract to the laboratory, and I got a read of five cannabinoids, THC, CBD, CBN, CBG. We're very excited. We look, and unfortunately, or lucky us, we saw that actually extract number two and extract number three regarding these five cannabinoids are exactly the same. For these five cannabinoids, it's 8% CBD, 1% THC, something like that. It's very, very similar. So we were stuck here, and I, was, I read a little bit, and I realized that actually I have the bigger expert, one hour from me, Rafi Meshulam, I called Rafi, I said, hey Rafi, it's Danny Meiri from the Technion. I have this problem, say, hey, come along. I took the car, I went to Rafi, and for four hours I got all the Torah on one leg, okay? He told me about the endocannabinoid story, the cannabinoid, but most importantly, he told me that there is not five cannabinoids, that they find more than 100 different cannabinoids. In a review paper four months ago by Professor Lumin Hanush, he, he published that there is over than 144 different cannabinoids that have been published in academic uh, research, in, in, in the literature, okay? But if I was uh, not dis uh, disappointed in that point, so Rafi also had to tell me about the terpenes, that there are over 200 terpenes, and there are also uh, flavonoids. So we know today, again, from this re uh, review by Lumi Hanush, that there is more than 500 different compounds in the cannabis extract. So we understood that we're actually looking on the tip of the iceberg. We look at about five cannabinoids, THC, CBD, CBG, but there is like 500 compounds in the extract that I'm using. So where can we start? For half a year, I stuck my head to the wall. <laughs> I went to Colorado, I went to Washington, I met with physicians, I met with good growers, and it took me half a year to realize that actually nobody knows what he's talking about. <laughs> it's cannabis. What do you mean? So the physician said it's a plant, okay? The girl said it's doing something, like there is like a gap between these two. People look on five cannabinoids still today, and this is the whole plant. We call it the entourage effect, something above us. We don't understand. It's doing something. But we don't look on all these parameters. It took half a year to realize that nobody can help me. And, and the breaking point was when I went to, to speak with one of the physicians in Israel, amazing physician, one of the best physicians in Israel. He treat kids with epilepsy, with cannabis. And I went to him, and I told him, what are you giving the kids? He said, I'm giving five milligram per kilogram child with, can with CBD, pure CBD. I said, oh. Thank you very much. Here's somebody who doesn't know what he's doing. He's giving fire. I said, how you purify the CBD? He said, oh, I don't know. The girl is giving me. 
Are you kidding me? Like how the growers is purifying them CBD? We are calling the grower and I ask him, hey, how you purify the CBD? He said, oh no, I have a strain that growing purified CBD. I said, are you real? Like what is crystals? He's growing crystals? Like, he said, do you know how much CBD? Yeah, it's something like 15%. He said, okay, so we have 85% something else. It's not purified. Purified, it's 100%. If it's 99%, it's not purified. Okay? So on that spot, I came back to the Technion, and I realized that we're in a huge problem. So most of the world use HPLC in order to identify cannabinoids. So in, for one, half a second, I will explain. There is like a colon that you put HPLC, it's high pressure liquid chromatography. So you put the extract in one side after you dilute it in, and it's running in the colon. In the colon there is beads, like marbles, okay? And it's need to cross these marbles, the, the, the material. And the materials have polarity, let's call it like electricity charge. And you need to cross these marbles that have also electricity charge. So if you have low electricity, it will low polarity, it will re run faster. If it's have High polarity will run lower. In that way, you separate the cannabinoids. In the end of the column, there is a detector that every time that cannabinoid or material falling, it will draw a line. So in order to know what is this line, so you measure how long it takes it to go out by time. So you said, okay, after 12 minutes, 30 seconds, 3 milliseconds, there is kind of a material that's getting out, okay? So, but you don't know what it is. In order to know, you need a purified material. So if you can buy from Roche company, from Merck, purified THC, synthetic THC, you can run in parallel and to understand when it's coming out and then to understand that in your graph, this is the THC. So there is two problems. One major problem, we have 13 synthetic cannabinoids today. So we can understand up to 13, okay, from the 144. Second problem, there are few cannabinoids that are running on the same, they have the same polarity. So actually from these 13, you can actually read or look up to eight, something like that. So we're again in the same problem. So if you have now a material that you don't have, you have a peak here, that you don't have the synthetic one, you just don't know what it is. So to cut the story short, we, we, we develop a method using different equipment that today we are actually the only lab, as far as I know, that can see and distinguish all the materials in cannabis. We have the ability today to see all the cannabinoids, all the terpenes, all the flavonoids in the plant. We are not blind anymore. So what, we are show what I'm showing you here, it's called the heat map. These are, where is, da -da -da. just a moment, I lost. Here, it's coming back. Okay, this line here, it's names of cannabinoids that we, dis that we can uh, identify as in going down and down, okay? It's just part of them. So this is THC that we all know. This is CBD, but there is many others. Part of them probably you never heard of, like CBGO or epoxy CBGA, okay? But these are cannabinoids that are there. And these are 20 strains. So every line here, it's a different strain that a patient can get in Israel. And when, if we'll talk uh, this epoxy CBGA, if it's dark, the meaning that in this strain, this cannabinoid expre highly expressed. If it's white, the meaning that it's not expressed. And what I want to show you here, we are looking about 20 different strains in Israel and try to look. There is no, none, not two of them that look similar. Every one of them, it's like a different medicine. So it's not surprising that one increased appetite and the other is not increased appetite. That one with reduced pain and the other will not reduced pain. One will you feel alert and the other will feel you will feel sleepy. All these side effects or all these effects that are different between strain, you can understand them from here. They are totally different. If there are two that high THC, they are totally different in many other parameters so that you just didn't look on them. So if you look on the blue lines. The first one, this is extract number two and extract number three that we looked before. So even though they have the same amount of CBD and the same amount of THC, look how different they are. So it's not surprising that one is killing breast cancer and the other is not killing breast cancer. They're just different. So we call them 
cannabis, and we call them high THC, low CBD. So what? They are totally different. Okay? So we're doing the same for, for uh, uh, tear pains. Having this ability in the lab totally changed the way the lab works. Mainly because every grower, every clinical trial, every physician, every startup approached the lab and said, hey, we need your help. We want to see what we're working with. We're doing now clinical trial on pain patient, but actually every pain patient get different cannabis, but we want to know what is getting, so help us, okay? So this totally changed the lab, and the lab today built from four different groups. First group, I have a chemist analysis group. I'm not a chemist analyst, but I have a group in my lab that doing it. So we are checking what is the difference between ethanol extraction, butane extraction, CO2 extraction. It's totally different. We take the same flowers and you get different material. The bottom line, the patient will get a different medicine. Okay? What is the difference in the bioavailability, bioavailability while you're smoking or you're taking a pill? What is actually reaching to your blood? We can ask all these questions because we are not blind anymore. We can look on this cannabinoid. So I have a, a big group that's asking all these questions, doing all this work. I have a group that's doing neuro, neurobiology, mainly epilepsy. And I, I won't touch it too much. I just told, tell that in Israel, in the beginning of the work, the patient got three different strains from three different growers. High CBD, low THC. Two of them work quite well, and one of them didn't work, and they stopped using it. Today, we have the ability to look on the strains that didn't work versus the strains that work, and even though they have the same amount of CBD, to look on other parameters that are existing in other cannabinoids that are existing in the strains that work better on the kids that didn't, versus the strains that didn't work, and take it to animal models to make it, to understand why it's working like that. And for that, we have a lot of work in the lab. I will skip on it, and I won't talk about it. I, I, I can, you know what, I will say just one word. This is the main strain that we are using on kids, okay? I, I, I won't talk about the parameter, what we're checking, but as the bar is highest, the meaning that this strain is work better on the epileptic mice, okay? And this is, the, this is the, the strain that the kids get in Israel. From eight different strains with high CBD, low THC, according to our result, they're using the shitty one, okay? <laughs> and the reason they're using it is because that's what they had on the bench four years ago. So it's working quite well. We have nine kids seizure-free. I think that there is one of physicians from Israel here that will talk about this research, so I won't get into details probably because you will correct me, so I won't go tell things that are not accurate. But it's working quite well. We have 36 to 40% uh, success with these kids that none of other medicines work on them. So it's working, but the question, can we get 60%? Can we get 75% if we will use different strains that work better? So this was epilepsy. We're working on brain development, Alzheimer a little bit, we're doing a lot, but I won't touch it. I want to go back to the cancer research, which is still the main thing in my lab. And in the cancer research, I don't want, there is a huge difference between treating cells on the plate, treating a mice, and treating a person. There is 10 years work and few millions of dollars that burn that probably it won't work in the end, okay? So I'm not saying that cannabis now, it's a treatment to a, a cancer. Don't take it that way. But I want to show you results which showing, first of all, the complexity of, of this work that we're doing with cannabis and also maybe a little bit promising work with cancer. So again, how are we using it? How are we doing it? We're growing cells in a plate, but we can grow it in a plate that have many wells, many holes. So this plate called 96 wells. So you can take pancreatic cancer, growing from, from a patient, growing in, in this plate, and actually do 96 different experiments in one plate, okay? So I have, in my lab, I have this machine. It's called high-throughput screen uh, machine. This is actually an incubator that the cell can grow live inside. There is the right pressure, the right humidity, the right temperature, oxygen, uh, CO2, whatever cells need in order to grow. 
okay? But it also have a microscope that's set on top of it, and this microscope is a very accurate microscope that can take images and move between wells and take images. It's a fluorescent microscope that you can put markers on, on the cells. So actually it can take over than 1,000 images an hour. So if you took, pay, put a plate inside, wait 24 hours, you will have 24,000 images. And you can analyze the images and, and you can see how many cells die in each well, how many cells proliferate, how many cells move. So you get in the end like a table which send you, will tell you, hey, in well 9E it was the best, it was the most effective treatment. So you can take 96 different extract, put on a plate and see if, uh, for a specific type of cancer which one is working the best and from them to start do uh, better research. Okay, this is like screening, first screening. So I want to show you a few results. So we are looking on, on something that similar to the images I showed before. Every color here, it's a different strain that being given to patient in Israel. And we look on melanoma cells now, a skin cancer. And this is how, what is the percentage of the cells that die? And this is the, the concentration of the extract. So let's take one concentration, four microgram per ml. So you see that there are strains that are doing nothing to these cells, there are strains that will kill 50% of the cells, there are strains that are very efficient by killing the cells. It's very similar to what I showed you, but in better statistic and better and more view. And if you look on one extract, just for example, you see that in melanoma, it's very efficiently killing the cells, and in uh, lung cancer, it's less efficiently. So there is a specificity between type of cannabis to type of cancer. So you'll say, okay, maybe part of this is high THC, high CBD, as we know. So to cut this out, what we did, we chose one of the strain, MIC A, which kill something like 60% of the cells, okay? And we purified the THC and the CBD from this strain, and we put them as a purified. And even if we put 10 times higher what we use in the strain here, the same CBD and THC is doing nothing to the cells. So it's not the THC and CBD alone, or it's not the THC and CBD. So maybe the THC and CBD needs a friend, their, how we call it, the entourage effect, the family, familia effect, okay? So in order to answer this, we're taking this purified THC and CBD from the plant, for the plant from the extract that killed the cells, and we add them to the other extracts that we have. And we see that we don't see much difference not significantly, so little bit. So you take an uh, extract that is high CBD and you add the THC in the CBD, and there is a little bit improvement, not bringing it to the place that we want. You're taking strains without THC in CBD at all. It's high CBG, there is no, and it's not changing. So adding the THC in the CBD in melanoma, it's not the key. There is other compounds that are doing this effect that we are looking for, okay? So another example, we're taking, you know what, I will go further, we, I will do blow up on this one. You see now with the, if the bars are, are low, it's how, how many cells survive. So as the, the bar are low, it's meaning that it kills more cells, it's more effective. So you see a strain called Santica, which is without THC and CBD, it's just high CBD, uh, CBG. And you look on this strain and you see that if you're doing ethanol extraction, it's kill very efficiently the cells. If you're doing CO2 extraction on the same flowers, it's not affecting the cells anymore. So just changing the extraction method can totally change the effective of the plant. So if I didn't mess around with you too much, so I will go to another sample to do it more complicated. So now we'll look on prostate cancer. And again, the same idea is availability. So how many cells survive? So if the bar is low, the meaning that extract number one was very efficient. So we take six different extract and we treat the cell, the prostate cancer. We see that just extract number one is efficient. So again, I know exactly the difference between treat cells on my, uh, treat mice or cells on the plate, treat a person, but let's do a game. Okay, let's do extrapolation now. And said, if everything that I showed you now is, re is real, so if it really can cure prostate cancer or kill prostate cancer, what the possibility that now a patient in Israel will go to the grower 
and will get something that will help him. According to this result, it's one to six, at least. Okay, what is the possibility that you will choose the right one? Now, to be a little bit more the bad guy, I will tell you that extract number one, extract number six, is exactly the same extract. Strained chelet from Siach company. It's the same flower. We extract the oil. We separate to two vials. One of them we activate. You know what the meaning of activate? The, the cannabinoids in the plant coming as an acid. THC, it's THC acid. CBD, it's CBD acid. CBG, it's CBG acid. In order to move them from THCA to THC, THCA is not psychoactive. You eat the flower, you won't be stoned. In order to make it active, what we call it, when I said to my student, active, they want to kill you. Okay, but let's say to make it psychoactive, you need a boost of heat. This is the reason we are small. People that are smoking, smoking it, okay? That's the reason why people making cookies, using Banglasi in India. The reason to do it is that you need a boost of heat in order to activate it, okay? So, extract number one is the, before hitting the plant, before activation. And extract number six, it's after activation. So now we'll tell you again, if a patient going to the to to the grower and taking cannabis, he is very lucky guy. He won the lottery and he took the right extract. Now he need to need to know that he can't smoke it, he can't evaporate it, and he can't hit it because if he will do it, it's not working anymore. So in order to say that now Daddy is telling us that it's better not to eat cannabis, I will show you that in glioblastoma it's the opposite. Just the active form is working. So the bottom line, we know nothing. <laughs> that's, that's the truth, I'm sorry. We don't know how to treat the patient. We don't know what to do. And this is an example. It's the same with Crohn's disease. It's the same with pain. It's the same with, with epilepsy, not, okay? But for other effects, we don't know what we have in the plant and we don't know how to treat the patient. By luck, we are, okay, this is not helping, change this, this is not helping, change it, until we're reaching to a point that maybe it's helping. And I'm not against cannabis, it's working perfect on patient, but the truth is that we don't know what to give them, okay? So just now to give a little bit hope, so now I will show you a good result, okay? So the way we are looking on it in, in my lab now, we are looking on mutation very specifically. If we are talking about breast cancer, we'll talk about breast cancer with specific mutation. So what we see here now, the blue line is breast cancer without any mutation. The red line is mutation, specific mutation, specific protein that reduce 50% of the activity of this protein. The green is 30% activity, and the, and the yellow is null mutation. There is no activity of this protein. And every bulk like this, it's a different strain that we, we, we screen. Okay, so you see, most of the cannabis is not affecting this breast cancer with this mutation until we find one extract that when you don't have mutation, it's not affecting the cells. When you have a mutation that reduces 50, it's starting to affecting. When you have a mutation that reduces 70% of the activity, it's working very well. And when you have a mutation that really creates cancer, and really affecting and, and really vulnerable, then cannabis can kill it. And this is exactly what we look, because now this strain will kill just the tumor cells and not hurt other cells. So this is exciting result, and we have two hits now, one with leukemia and one with breast cancer that is going to next step for a clinical trials. So all the mess that I showed you, we realized that we are the laboratory, actually, that have the ability to look on all the cannabinoids, all the 144 cannabinoids, all the terpene. So actually, we know in a good way what the patient is getting. He's not getting THC and CBD. He's getting all this gamish, okay? So how we are want to deal with all of this mess? So what we suggest, we call it the database project. And what we suggest, we said, okay, let's do first database on the strains in Israel. So in Israel, every cannabis, every strain that's being picked, every bulk, every batch, sorry, every batch that's being picked, every extract, every peel, 
everything that a patient can get in Israel is growing through my lab first. And my lab doing identification, metabolomics, for all the cannabis in Israel. So I have a barcode for everything that the patient can get. If my grandma got Scooby-Doo in December, I know exactly what was in Scooby-Doo. Okay, Scooby-Doo, it's the name of a strain. <laughs> so I know exactly what the patient is getting. So we create a database, and you ask why to check every batch. So look on this one. This is the same strain, the same genetic, come from the same mother that's been grown in different location, just different greenhouse. And look how much they are different. The same strain, same genetics, grown in different location. They look totally different. So for every batch, every time that we're picking cannabis, every time that we want to give to the patient, I need to check what it is. So we had this arm that doing the strain database. We're checking all the cannabis in Israel. And then we did a an arm that looking on the patient. We are collecting all the data on the patient. We create, it took us a year, over than a year, and we invest a huge amount of money, millions of dollars, in order to create this database, to create a questionnaire that actually answering all the, the diseases that the patient can get cannabis for it. There is a specific questionnaire for Crohn, a specific questionnaire for pain, specific questionnaire for Alzheimer or Alzheimer, no. So what else we have? For, for, for autism, okay? And when the patient is starting to fill it up, he's feeling in the beginning, I'm a male, 43 years old, uh, economic situation, whatever. And then when you press it, I have a Crohn disease, it will open a specific question for Crohn. If he's taking from Tikkun Olam, it will open the strain from Tikkun Olam that he can get. It depends on what the patient, and we get all the data, and the idea is to learn a little bit more about how to treat patients. So the idea is to take this data and combine it with that data to say, in these 55 strains, it's increased appetite in 85% of the patient. What are the common compounds in these 55 strains that increase appetite that are not existing in the strain that don't increase appetite to minimize it to few compounds and this to take to animal model clinical trials to make it evidence-based. That the physician or the grower, I don't know who, will come to treat a patient, he will know what is increased appetite, what he increased uh, heart beating, what is changing the glucose metabolism in our body? What is reducing pain better? What is reducing inflammation? We need to know, we need to treat the patient. A, one thing that is good to one patient can be very harmful to other patients. So if you are, um, if you are a cancer patient that get the, uh, chemotherapy and you suffer now from vomiting and you have, a, uh, uh, you, you are, uh, have nausea, so you want to reduce nausea, to reduce vomiting, and to increase appetite to this patient. But now if you are a patient with a chronic pain, a neuropathic pain in your, in your back, and you're also very fat, I'm not sure that I want to increase your appetite, okay? So the same thing can be good and bad. As, as physicians, if we, if we call it a medicine, we need to know how to treat the patient. And this is the goal. I want to show you one result, and then I will finish with aut autistic kids in Israel. So the story, how, how long I have? I'm, I have more than minutes? Oh, so I can go back to results that I skipped. I'm kidding. Okay. So the story about autistic kids in Israel started a little bit more than a year ago when we had three kids with very severe autism that had also seizures. And they got the treatment for the, for the seizure to reduce seizures. And after two months, these families, these three families came back to the physician and said, hey, for the, for the epileptic-like, for the seizure, it, it worked, but not perfect. It reduced something like 50% of the seizure. But it really changed our lives. Our kids are not violent anymore. They don't have the anxiety. They are most, more verbal. They, are, they can concentrate more. And these kids got cannabis, which are similar to the cannabis that we are giving to the uh, epileptic kids. So we are giving them high CBD, low THC. So these kids are not stoned. It's not sedation of these kids or the autistic kids. 
It's, it's something else, but it's reduced the violence, it reduced the anxiety, it's improved the, the, the eye contact, the verbal, it's totally changed the waves of the, the lives of these families. And Israel, like Israel, everything is not going straight. So these families, it's like a community. They give to their friends and their friends give to their friends. So until we realize what's happened, we have already 20 kids that have been treated, three legal, 17 illegal, <laughs> that got cannabis and it's improved the, the, the kids' uh, phenomena. It's the symptoms, the symptoms, I will call it that way. And then there was one day that one of these mothers had been arrested because she gave cannabis, they, they find cannabis in the house. And there was a huge mess in Israel. How you arrest a mother that gave to a seven kids years old cannabis that helped with autism and you're going and arrest them, okay? So the Minister of Health called, we, we got a call from the Minister of Health, asked, Daddy, what do you think about autism? I said, I know nothing about autism, okay, I'm sorry or I'm not sorry, I'm happy, but I know nothing about autism. So we actually called four people, and he had like a small committee asking what to do with it. And I must say that I was totally against it. I thought that is a mistake to give to a, a child that to have a problem in his brain, and we don't understand this problem, we give him something that's very complex that can affect him. But probably I was wrong. And what he, what he, say, what he uh, offered, he offered that to start to treat in a small scale, to do scale, to do like a pilot in one of the hospitals in Israel. And one of the neuropediatricians took it on, on himself, Adi Aran from Sharei Tzedek, and he started to treat kids with autism with the cannabis. So up today we have around 200 kids that getting cannabis, most of them under prescription of Adi Aran. Today it's starting to grow. And the result was phenomenal. I think it's the most significant result that I saw till today from all things, from pain. From, we are participating in 13 different clinical trials, my lab, in pain, in Crohn, many. I think this is the most significant. So these kids getting cannabis, which are high CBD, low THC, they're not stoned, and really die, like the results totally changed the lives of these families. But four months ago, we had one day of crisis. We got call after call. I got calls from the, this physician, and then calls starting to, to, to come from the families that kids, one after another, become very violent. There was like crisis. One kid, 17 years old, just jumped on his mother and beat her until she had to be hospitalized. And she explained to me later, she said, look, he's 17 years old. F from he was 12. I never stayed alone with him because he was very violent. And just my husband or my older kid had to stay with me. But in the last half a year, we don't need it anymore. There was no violence, no uh, uh, anxiety. So I don't know what's happened today that he will become like again, again like a demon, like a demon. Okay. So a call after a call, there was a crisis with families that something bad happened after half a year or a year that they didn't see this effect. So I went to the head of the data press project in my lab, Tali, said, Tali, do me a favor. These are the numbers of the kids. I have them in numbers. I don't have the names. Said, these are the numbers of the kids. Please check out what we know of them. After three minutes, she came back, said, Daddy, all these kids getting from the same grower. Again, we have eight authorized growers in Israel. All these seven kids get from the same grower. I said, oh. This is amazing. I'm calling the, to the girl. I said, hey, this is the story. From the morning, we are now at noon. We have already seven kids that got these materials from you. What have been changed? I said, Daddy, we changed nothing. It's the same extract, 20 to 1 CBD to THC. We checked it. Nothing is wrong. I said, hey, look, for sure something is wrong. Call back these materials. And let's check them. I said, Daddy, nothing is wrong. Everything is the same. I'm calling the physician. I said, hey, Adi send me a sample of what they got today. And we get a sample, and we realize that actually the growers changed the strain that he used the extract from. So we have a fingerprint for all the strains in Israel. Immediately I can see that he's using different strain, okay? He didn't lie about having 20 to 1 CBD to THC. For this grower, 
It's the same material. That's what he's looking on. CBD to THC, 20 to 1. He didn't change anything. But if you look on these trains, how different they are, okay? It's not the same material. So what we learn from that, that the CBD and the THC, it's not the most important thing to, to, to reduce an anxiety on, on violence on these kids. And it's a bad story, but for me, it's a gold mine, okay? Because now I have just few cannabinoids that I suspect that they are reducing anxiety and we can take it to animal more than clinical trials to make it an evidence-based that we need this one in order to, do, to have this effect. So this is the idea of this database. We want to reach to 50, 60,000 patients that the stat will stress, and we have a few thousand now of patients that are running. And I hope that from not, not knowing, not see where to go, we will get a direction of, of cannabis. So basically, this is, this is how we get our fundings. And this is the amazing people in my lab that are doing all this work while I'm going around telling stories. So <laughs> thank you very much.